All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambia Grove and this afternoon's conversation around blockchain. My name is Maura Little. I am the interim executive director here at Cambia Grove. For those of you who have never been to Cambia Grove, we are a healthcare transforma transformation hub focused on connecting entrepreneurs with the traditional healthcare sector. We do this through programming, partnerships, and public engagement all around the idea of catalytic healthcare change. Today, we are honored to host this event with our uh, IF team from Cambia Health Solutions, the Innovation Force team, and we are thrilled to welcome our esteemed guest. With that, here is the panel. Oh, I'm sorry, with that, Nicole uh, from our IF team is going to uh, discuss a couple of things around the panel and the IF team. Thank you. Thanks, Maura. Uh, so, uh, again, my name is Nicole. On behalf of Cambia and Cambia's innovation team, we wanted to welcome you. Um, before we get started, just a little housekeeping. We'll go for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have some open Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, keep them. We'll answer them later. Um, we had one change in the uh, session today. Instead of Max moderating, um, Dr. Oksana Pickerel is going to be our moderator for this evening. So with that, Oksana. Thank you. Uh, and welcome, everyone. This is a topic that always draws a lot of attention. We seem to be in various combinations of great speakers talking about it lately quite a bit. Um, and um, I know this generates a lot of interest, a lot of questions. I'll, I'm going to try to anticipate a lot of questions that we frequently get. Uh, before we jump in and um, introduce our panelists, a uh, quick show of hands. How many people are doing anything with blockchain today in this audience? How many are doing that in healthcare? All of that is, is healthcare. How many are exploring or perhaps planning a pilot or getting close? Okay. And I guess the rest are curious. Um, how many are skeptical? <laughs> okay, <laughs> including the ones that are doing it. That's, that's, um, that's really good to know. Uh, so, so I think um, what I'd like to uh, have our panelists do, we've got an absolutely fantastic lineup today uh, between Chris and Lisa and Max. What I would like to do as part of the opening, if you could just quickly introduce yourself so we'll save ourselves a little bit of time for discussion and uh, say a few words about where you are on your blockchain journey today. And then Lisa, when we get to your introduction, maybe, maybe we'll start with Chris and Max and Lisa, as part of your introduction, if you would just give us the 101 on, 101 on, 101 on blockchain, that would be fantastic. Can you let me do all that without actually, <laughs> nobody said anything. Start over. <laughs> Hello, I'm Chris Young. <laughs> Hi everybody, uh, Max Janicek. Um, I'm in the innovation team at Cambia Health Solutions. Uh, if you're not familiar with Cambia, um, our cause is really focused on uh, tra transforming healthcare. Uh, more person focused, more economically sustainable. Um, we own companies like uh, Regions Blue Cross Blue Shield and a series of other companies like HealthSpark um, and technology and services in healthcare. Um, as far as blockchain goes, we're really in the uh, investigation space. We are looking at the maturity of the technology, partnerships that might accelerate it. Um, we're closely monitoring the fintech space and trying to learn from the financial services. We think they're definitely um, far ahead, I guess, of where healthcare is on this topic. And um, so really it's, it's learning right now and it's uh, identifying those use cases. You know, Chris mentioned a few like pre-auth that we have in uh, common, I would say. Um, some of the Medicare space we believe is, could really be uh, improved through blockchain. And so we would, we would love to move forward some initiatives in those spaces. I'm Lisa Mackey. Can you hear me? I'm on. Okay. Uh, good to be here. This essentially is home for me. I grew up in Kitsap County, so it's nice to be here in Washington State. Uh, I am the co-founder and now board member of PocketDoc. We are a platform for the business of health. Uh, many of you, if you've built product or new applications or services in healthcare, may have experienced some interoperability uh, challenges to getting to market at scale. So PocketDocs uh, 
objective was to build a unifying programmable interface for all of healthcare's business transactions to start. So that included connections to uh, insurance company gateways for eligibility and claims and referrals, moved into, once we realized that it's tough to process that if you don't know who someone is, we moved into identity verification and resolution, uh, also integration with the major EMRs, I think it's over 33 now, and then uh, building out some simple use cases that many of our customers were asking for, uh, out-of-pocket cost calculators, uh, simple e-commerce, uh, so search, uh, book an appointment, pay for it up front if someone hasn't met a deductible, uh, and uh, a few others. Uh, so uh, we did that first, so this gets me to blockchain 101. Um, healthcare, when you think about it, and it's uh, interesting for Max to say that they're tracking fintech, healthcare is really an intersection of a lot of stakeholders, not just healthcare. When you think there's a financial component to it, there's an insurance component, not just health insurance, but increasingly life insurance. Uh, there, there's, an, uh, there's a supply chain component to it. If you're trying to order and deliver medical goods or pharmaceuticals, and it's difficult for all of these stakeholders to interact with a patient at the center uh, on their behalf and to exchange data efficiently. Most of healthcare was designed pre-internet, pre-mobile. Uh, it didn't anticipate those innovations. Uh, and it doesn't deal with uh, the innovations such as interoperability, real-time, cloud, consumer-driven transactions at scale very well. And it didn't have to. You know, there were reasons not to, security reasons. It didn't have to for a long time. But with the shift of cost to consumers uh, and some of the new clinical innovations, uh, IoT, connected health, uh, more and more the, there is a, um, a driving need for these innovations. And also, now that we're seeing increasing security concerns uh, that cause healthcare to start to look to the cloud and new technologies to increase security, you need that. So when you think about what healthcare really is, all these different stakeholders, um, all these consumers expecting to interact with healthcare over these sorts of devices in the same way that they do the rest of their lives, what you're describing is a distributed network uh, of stakeholders who, ha uh, who want to and will exchange data on behalf of that consumer, that individual, that patient, uh, at their request and to provide services to them. Uh, blockchain, uh, if, you, if you put aside what, blockchain's really a distributed network. It's a distributed network with some really unique uh, capabilities. Time stamping. Every, uh, every transaction that takes place in a blockchain network is timestamped, so you know when it happened. Uh, think about how great that is when you're trying to figure out, uh, or you're thinking about new ways to store uh, ele medical records or medical data uh, procedures for an individual and sharing that information. It's highly secure. It's got the highest uh, cryptographic security available today, and we'll increasingly incorporate that. Uh, it has a shared ledger. Everyone who participates in a distributed network with blockchain technologies has a copy of every transaction that occurs in that network. Uh, they don't have access to the data that that ledger points to necessarily. They have to satisfy the permissions and, and uh, requirements, the business rules, but they all have a copy, uh, which means uh, every, every participant in that network has the same information, and if they satisfy the permissions, has access to the same information as everyone else. So you no longer have the same interoperability challenge that you have today uh, with these asynchronous networks and uh, offline networks that we're often, often working with. So think of it less as this new magic thing called blockchain, and think of it more as a peer-to-peer -peer distributed network that doesn't have to put push transactions through any central authority in order to get them done. So how many of you are aware that healthcare has a central clearing party for almost all of its business transactions? Okay, so for example, Embion or Availity. You may have heard those names. 
Those are central clearing parties that need to process everything from an eligibility check to a claim submission status reimbursement. Um, just like FinTech, blockchain removes the requirement for that. It's not that those companies won't have other services and other things that they can provide that will uh, continue to operate in healthcare, but you no longer need to send a claim through MDON you know, if you're if you're Ascension, you no longer have to send a claim through MDON to get over to uh, Regents, Cambia, uh, for example. It removes that need, so you can have peer-to-peer -peer interactions. None of this is new. This didn't happen today. Peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transactions and distributed networks is something that we were talking about at Microsoft in 2006. And we didn't really do a whole lot with it at the time because the compute power wasn't sufficient to really run it at scale. And, um, and the recession happened. <laughs> other things happened. And Bill Gates left. And you know, other, other, other things happened to interrupt that prog progress. So this isn't new. These technologies, a lot of them are not new. But they've just never been brought together in this way before at scale with this kind of compute power. So I'll stop there. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And I think just to pick up on, uh, you know, the the acceptability of technology on readiness of the end users, be that payers, providers, pharma, to use them. Uh, Chris, maybe if we can think al talk a little bit about your thought process when you to when you talk about those use cases that make sense in your world, the auto adjudication, the pre-authorization, the others that are bubbling up to the top. What are some of the patterns that are a good fit for blockchain in, in the very practically minded, really, way that you think about it? So the, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. So the, uh, I had to check. Um, I think the, the most important thing that we're going to care about is consumer centricity. You know, we, uh, we're going to be focused around, and we have been focused around um, the patient, but the patient isn't what healthcare systems should necessarily always be focused on because you may not be a patient. When you move from fee for service to fee for value, in that movement in healthcare, you're you're really trying to align resources and everything to keep people um, and and keep them healthy and keep them well. It's, I mean, quite frankly, the entire healthcare system should be aligned to do, but it's not right now. So you've got all these disparate data sets that are out there, and the thing that that drives, I think, my thinking first and foremost is how do we create some sort of level of connectivity among all those networks because there's been so much time and effort put into that over the last decade and it hasn't achieved the results. You don't. You have data at a pharmacy. You have data at your doctor's office. You have data from a hospital visit. You went to one place. You went to another hospital. You have data there. You have healthcare related data that's on a credit card and you don't even realize it. Um, you have Fitbits. And a consumer right now, actually, you technically own that data, sort of, but you don't. I mean, has anybody tried to get their comprehensive medical record pulled together? Anybody got that? Anybody? Thank you. Nobody. Nobody in a room of uh, however many people up here. Because it's hard. Everybody's got different EHRs. The EHRs aren't uh, inter uh, very compatible. So putting a thing together that has the, po the prospect of really pulling um, elements of information and linking them all together is the most important thing in my mind right now. It'll take a while before anything like that happens, but if we don't start, it certainly won't happen. Um, and it will empower a consumer because I believe that there will be multiple entities who will come up with consumer UI that says, here are all the pockets of data that you have that we know through blockchain because of the participants. And here, you know, it's not going to have them all shared, but it's going to be a pointer of sorts that says, you have data here, you have data here, you have your genomics data here. And by the way, these things have value to various people. And when you start pointing it all together, you have a much more complete picture of the person, right? So if you have genetic profiles, if you have lab data, if you have all the stuff that is not in a continuous record somehow and is put together, and let's say you put a little AI or machine learning on top of it to help, that, that changes the paradigm dramatically. And it starts, um, it starts us down a path where we can really look at all the inconsistencies and misalignments in healthcare, I think, where we can help um, consumers in a, in, a, in a major way. So that's... Can I ask you a question? <laughs> Me? Oh. <laughs> no, panelists do not get that privilege. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm breaking the rules. Please um, go ahead. <laughs> 
So uh, one, of the, one of the challenges that many of you may have encountered in trying to build product is that there's a resistance to pooling patient data because uh, bluntly said, most of the business models out there, the individual vendors, uh, for-profit vendors, is not to share data, it's actually to keep it in. One of the things blockchain does is, wait, would you agree, is allows them all to keep the data, keep their business models, but share just what's appropriate to complete something? Um, yes, I would and sort of agree And is it easier to agree to share in that <laughs> way? Exactly, yeah. I think, I think what it is going to do is allow and empower consumers in a whole new way. Um, because some of their data is their data. Now, not everything is. It depends on what the ecosystem you're talking about. The financial sector may be a little different. Healthcare, it is technically your record, getting access to it, and what part of it is, is relevant, contextually relevant from a given situation. But I mean, let me, let me give you an, uh, an example of why I think this is meaningful. So take a person who was a type 2 diabetic, and I just use this as an extreme example. And let's say they were 400 pounds and they lost 200 pounds. This happens. Does anybody know what happens when that happens? That's true. That's true. But let's talk about diabetes, for example. Do you still are you still a diabetic? <laughs> I, I do need to talk to you about plastic surgery. You sound like you know what you're talking about. I got I got some stuff here and maybe a chin thing. Um, diabetes can go away. You can cure diabetes with weight loss, right? Okay, so say you're, you're a payer or you're taking full dollar risk, right? Or first dollar risk. Wouldn't it be helpful to know if that person is staying on course or whether they gain that weight back? I mean, now, now this is a little big brotherish, but contemplate the following. What if you said, you're not going to get access to all my purchase data, but you are going to get to see what I buy from the grocery store. And you're going to get to see food-related transactions. This is all possible, right? Now you're opening up a window. So now you know if somebody's buying Twinkies. Now, I'm not going to debate whether Twinkies are healthy for you or not. That's for the individual. But an insurance company might take a particular viewpoint on that. And if you have patterns in purchasing and, and maybe lifestyle and fitness that are counter to the direction that you did, there's some inherent value or lack of value to that, right? That is what I think blockchain allows for, I think. Yeah, and I think the point I was making before is, and I totally agree with Chris, is a lot of people, uh, some of them in this town, have tried unsuccessfully, powerful, smart people with a lot of money, to get all of these stakeholders just share data so you could have a full copy of your record available somewhere. How many times do you really want a full copy of your record what you want is to be able to get what's meaningful from it when you need it and to be able to share it with the people who and the parts of it that are relevant so people can do things for you and help you, help you stay healthy, help cure you. So I don't really care if I have a full copy of it. I just care whether or not I can get to all the information I need and share it with the people I care about, which removes the need to pool, pool the data and all of a sudden overcomes all of this business model resistance in the industry that we've experienced up till now around sharing data. Yeah, I think, Lisa, that's, that's an excellent point. And also the, uh, the parallel that I think is really interesting. So when we're talking about both the scenarios and the data sharing and the uh, efforts to, uh, to enable interoperability, I think there are a lot of interesting parallels here between industries. So, so Max, I, I, I think it would be really interesting to think through, uh, you know, you've got experience with blockchain in, in FS, mm -hmm. financial services, and they're in a very different place in their hype cycle compared to where healthcare is right now. If anything, they're getting to the disillusioned trough uh, for, for, for the time being. So, so when you think about kind of bo both what we've learned from that experience, but also if we can dive a level deeper and think about uh, what are some of those parallels of scenarios where blockchain works great in FS, perhaps doesn't work great, and what are parallels between that and healthcare applications? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the reason I'm so intrigued by FinTech is, well, I, I came from FinTech before I entered healthcare, but you know, just working with partners who are in that space, I'm seeing so many different use cases. Um, in particular, you know, the way it's, I think, will start is cross-border transactions where there's a need for a currency, 
or a transaction with a tr uh, an untrusted party. Um, an example in banking is something called a letter of credit. So if you, if you purchase items, acquire items from, say, China, and you want to sell them in the U.S., you have to establish some kind of relationship. Before the, those goods go on that ship, right, there has to be proof that you're, you have money set aside to pay that supplier. But you don't want to just send that money because what if those goods come and they're destroyed in shipment, they don't meet your quality you know, expectations? Those are examples where blockchain is highly useful. Um, in healthcare, you know, I think when we talk about currencies or cryptocurrencies, um, that's probably a more unique use case in healthcare, where maybe you're traveling to a foreign country and need to acquire services and they don't have a way of really taking payment from you. So I think that's less critical than the idea of really the blockchain. And I'll just give you a personal example. Last week, my son had a, had a, a sore throat. I took him into a, like a, an urgent care clinic type experience. And I'm feeling good. I got him in 30 minutes. I got my prescription. They electronically sent it to Walgreens. So all's good. Um, but it's like 8 o'clock at night, and the prescription's not ready at 8.30. So I call, I'm checking on it. I, I do the automated thing. It won't be ready till 9.45. The pharmacy closes at 10. So I'm like, okay, I, I think I'm good. But I check again at 9.30, still not ready. So I'm like, I'm just going to call to make sure. I call, I find out that, well, the actually that prescription doesn't come in that form format. So it's it uh, it can't be chewable, it has to be a liquid. So, so okay, no problem. The pharmacist can clearly change that. It's just the same prescription, right? You just flip a bit in the system and out comes a liquid. That's how it would work, right? No, they're not authorized to do that. They have to get the doctor's permission to do it. Doctor's long gone, you know, closed at 8 o'clock to a clinic. So now it's, okay, what do we do now? Now I'm ready to say, let's just wait till tomorrow, but my wife is committed to getting this prescription filled by the end of the night. This has to start it today. She's convinced that you have to do it. So I, at that point, we start calling other clinics who are, the, they're in the same provider system, trying to get convinced them to go into the EMR and get a doctor to switch the script. So, you know, now it's 10.30. Uh, we finally get a hold of somebody. They, they convince the doctor to do, because we, now we're speaking we're in medical jargon, you know, even though we're not doctors. And then uh, finally they get it. Then they get a 24-hour pharmacy that's like 45 minutes away from my house. And my wife turns to me and says, I thought you were supposed to be fixing health care. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that's an example where when you talk about blockchain and a doctor being able to know that that item is identified as either not on formulary or you know, not provided and we're working off the same ledger, we're working off the same records, can eliminate a lot of that waste and time for the consumer. And so I get fueled really by what are the consumer everyday practical you know, things that save you an hour here, 45 minutes there, 200 bucks here, and how do we start to kind of, you know, change this mess that we have right now? You're here. Exactly. Uh, so picking up on that, uh, one of the first things when I started learning about blockchain, I was um, actually at Don Tapscott's, Tapscott's talk, and the first sentence out of his mouth was, if you want to understand blockchain, forget about Bitcoin. Just start without it, and you'll start to understand what the ledger is all about. So. I know perhaps there might be some different opinions on this panel about it, but do you need a coin in the healthcare blockchain? Well, I, I think the first thing you have to ask is do you need the blockchain? <laughs> um, there are a lot of things like, I, you know, some of the things that you just described, uh, pocket doc supports pharmacy benefit transactions today. If an EMR were to utilize our API, they could present. <laughs> to the doctor at the time of prescribing, whether or not it was on the formulary, wh you know, was there an alternative, how much does it cost, was it an in-network pharmacy, that, that's all available today without blockchain. So, uh, so there's, and that's when we're starting to describe some of the business model um, challenges. But, and, and when I think about currency, what's interesting about, currency gets back to are we trying you know that's a power struggle with the banks and then 
Um, but what's interesting about what's interesting about currencies for companies like Pocket Doc, as we we've uh, created a Doc Chain Alliance, and we are creating these use cases, uh, shared identity as a service, uh, referrals, and uh, autonomous uh, adjudication of claims, and a supply chain solution that we want to make available in production for people to call as a automated, you heard them call smart contracts, it's really just automation code, automated business rules. To seed that network, to provide incentives for people to process transactions across a new network, a currency or a coin is really handy <laughs> and, and it creates value. So when you think about it that way, it's a, it's a nice way to create value in the network and incentivize people to use a new one. Yeah, so I, I, I also agree that you should have a cryptocurrency um, because there are all these little pockets of inherent value that a consumer could control if they want to, mm -hmm. and I believe they should have a way to evaluate those things. Right now, what happens with uh, so many employers, like they'll have some sort of health challenge or something where you'll get some financial benefit, which may or may not be, you know, from if you walk 10,000 steps, you know, a day and um, – Whatever the, what is it, did you get them in today? <laughs> you are <laughs> such an overachiever. Um, Doesn't count, starts every day. Yeah, but there's no value tied to that. But but if, you, if you're a person who's, you know, 50 and you can run an eight minute mile, I saw this someplace, um, yeah, this is a good ad. Because then if you're really healthy, should you be paying as much for health insurance as somebody who's not? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think the answer is it depends. I think to what you can control, to the degree you should, there should be a way to value that. And and whether there should or not, there's going to be. There's th It's going to evolve at some point. Now, whether it's through, um, you know, with Pocket Doc or others, at the end of the day, it's going to happen because – because there, there is intrinsic value to those kind of activities. And if you eat healthy versus not, and, and you know, coming from uh, a Catholic health system, I very much, I'm on your side, I really am, in terms of I, I want everybody in society to have some level of, of insurance and I want them to be taken care of. Um, but, but there are circumstances that people face that they may not have access to decent food. So, you know, they're already presented with a lot of societal factors that are already working against them. And that's something else that needs to be worked with. But but I see this coming no matter what. There's going to be some sort of inherent valuation of those kind of things. And then I'd rather be part of shaping that than not being part of it. Well, one way to think about it that is less off, uh, per perhaps less um, offensive to this crowd than, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a different prices for different people based on, you know, health is with uh, – and we thought about this as a distributed platform uh, back in 2010 when my co-founder Ted Tanner and I were first thinking about PocketDoc was there's no reason you can't have real-time underwriting, uh, which then <laughs> – so I'd like to hear what Max has to say about this because if you think about it more in terms of there the annual uh, – the annual model of uh, collecting premium dollars, while it's great for an insurance company because it's like playing against the house, they get all the premium dollars up front, they know how much the revenue is, and they know how much they want you to win um, to pay out. And that, that's kind of a crass way to put it, and you can correct me, but I think about it that way. Um, that, but there's no technical reason why you have to follow that business model. And if you could give a efficient and revenue-generating way to do more real-time underwriting, then people could potentially pay for what they really need based on who they are in a more personalized fashion. So it's not penalizing one person over another. Um, it's more what's appropriate for you and what do you need? Because everybody, you know, what if I have a, a genetic disease? I might be in otherwise good health, but I have a genetic disease and I want to pay it for that kind of coverage. Did you see how she just dove yeah. in and saved me? So I'll, uh, I'll, t I'll tackle the first question, which was the currency question, separate from the other. Um, I don't necessarily think you need a cryptocurrency right now I, in, in healthcare. Um, I quite frankly think when you try to introduce something like that and the complexity and the how do you convert or, or transfer that currency, 
I think you're adding complexity on top of something people are already having trouble understanding. And in a risk averse you know, area like healthcare, I would rather tackle practical use cases that impact everyday life. As far as, you know, is there a niche for a cryptocurrency? Yes, I believe so. Um, and, I, and I give the cross-border example as that example. If you're traveling internationally at some point, some way of getting private care for your family um, if you can't access the government services because you're not a, um, you know, a, a, a resident of that country. That would be an example, but that's a very niche application while we all decide as, a, as citizens whether we're willing to forego central bank management of our currency. And that's a much deeper question that I don't think healthcare is going to impact. I think that's going to happen financially and healthcare will adopt and evolve cryptocurrency from what happens in the broader use of currency. Um, so that's my viewpoint on currency. As far as um, some of the other topics there, um, I think if you look at healthcare and the way the money is spent, you know, I, I saw a stat recently that about only 6% of the actual revenue of a transaction um, with, say, a, you know, a patient seeing a doctor actually goes to the doctor. So it, in my view, you know, and I'm, our, I'm trying to figure out how to disrupt all this waste, right? Um, whether it's the insurer, the provider, you know, administration along the way, government, we got to find a way to make that connection between the patient and the provider and have that value maximized for those two parties. And, and if blockchain helps us disrupt the insurer, the administrators, the government, that's what I'm excited about because the rest of it is noise and we can you know, blame one party or another, but to me, none of that matters. Like how do we make that, maximize that value of that interaction, right? And not have our physicians fleeing their practices and frustrated, you know, if, if you talk to a lot of doctors today, my, I've lost my last three PCPs. They, they don't take insurance anymore, right? They're just tired of dealing with the bureaucracy, the pre-auth. Um, it's got to change. So hopefully we can design something or somebody will, you know, hopefully we're part of it, design it right. And if it wipes out some of these players along the way, so be it, as long as it creates the better experience for all of us. So it, um, I can say from experience dealing with some of our customers, a good portion of the cost that, uh, co that causes providers to perhaps charge more than they normally would um, because they aren't getting the full amount, they aren't even getting close to the majority you know, of that back, is because we've got circa 1998 clearing systems between them, these two people, that they're going through that in today's technical world aren't necessary. They could all be fully automated. They are, I mean, we fully automate them. They can all be real time. Uh, we will, PocketDoc will disintermediate its own clearinghouse services as we move to DocChain. We'll just get rid of them. We'll enable them as smart contracts or we'll just get rid of them altogether because they are not necessary. Uh, so that's a huge amount of cost and revenue cycle and stability uh, waste that we can immediately remove from the system uh, with, y you can do it, and, and to be perfectly honest, you could do it today without blockchain, but blockchain creates a way for us to unify all the stakeholders around a common set of goals in a way that we haven't been able to get them to do before. So if that's what it takes, I'm all over blockchain, fine. Um, but it, in some cases, it actually isn't necessary. Yeah, and I think uh, th that also brings up an interesting question. So, Chris, when you think about implementation, you're ready to start experimenting. You're ready to, uh, you, you have a, your head around what, what scenarios are the right fit. Uh, what type of buy-in does it require in the organization to make it happen? Yeah, so this is kind of interesting because in this alliance that we have, we have a lot of different companies that are all facing the same kind of uphill battle. So first off, you have to educate a lot of people about the basics of blockchain, which um, if you don't do it real simply, you lose a lot of people um, very quickly. Um, so that's thing number one. Thing number two, realizing you are going to disrupt some inherent pra uh, practices that are in place 
maybe in your own um, business as well in others. Blockchain is going to do, uh, eventually it'll get put in. Eventually the clearinghouse model and eventually this, this um, thing of we submit a claim, claim is denied. We fight back, back and forth, and you have armies on both sides fighting this out. Um, that is not good for the healthcare ecosystem. I don't know how many, um, it'd be interesting to know how many FTEs are, exist between the payers and providers in America that are, that are on both sides of that. When in fact, you know, you could make it very easy for a consumer, and I just think about the pre-authorization battle, something's pre-authorized and by the time it's actually theoretically approved, it's gone past its pre-authorization expiration date, and then you're back to square one, and it drives consumers absolutely crazy. Um, this is the kind of thing that we need to figure out collaborative solutions, and I think, um, you know, it's it's important to really frame it in a business context where people get it. Um, there is Did a. Did you have an easy time doing that? No, no. It's you know you can educate people, but when you when you get right down to it, I go to the highest level stakeholder. You know, I went to our CFO and said at the end of the day, what if we could adjudicate claims instantaneously through smart contracts? Now there's a long way to get there. What if we could do that? M it may not be on everything, because, you know, you might have uh, a very complex contract that goes over time, but what if you could do it for the things you could do it for? Mm -hmm. Okay, that impacts AR very quickly. Now, that impact on AR on the provider side is a benefit. On the payer side, that creates uh, a challenge to the business model. Mm -hmm. It will. Um, but you have to articulate it, you have to educate, and I think you have to show an uh, inherent value of what, th what does this look like? And this is a daily challenge that I think everybody who's even going through this is, is experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be easy, but I think any kind of major overhaul is never easy up front. So if people understand that when he says AR is accounts receivable, so you guys all know that. that I, and currently what the it's somewhere between 14 to 120 days variable and no guarantee you, might, you will get paid. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's that is a that is a health system accounts receivable revenue cycle reality. How it can, if if you if you aren't in healthcare today or you aren't haven't always been in healthcare, can you imagine running a business with that as your revenue cycle with model? I can't. Yeah, and that's what so that's what health systems are doing every day. So one of the one of the reasons we got into it was at least with high deductible plans, could we help you identify people having met their deductible and give them a discount for paying up front so you wouldn't have to put them into that and then ultimately watch it go into collections because you couldn't find them after they left? I mean, that what the rest of the world calls e-commerce hasn't been possible in healthcare until now, which is ridiculous. You don't need blockchain to solve that <laughs> problem, but if we can get all, if we can get the banks and the health systems and the payers and everybody else around, and the freestanding radiology labs and and everyone else to participate in a network that facilitates those kinds of transactions quickly, at low cost, with low clearing times, if not quite instantaneous, maybe three days, that would be miraculous to your CFO. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Then then it's worth it. So I, my guess is that there's two ways this plays out. Um, one way is the traditional way where consultants, you know, have blockchain solutions. They come in and they sell them to payers and, and providers, and they test. They take incremental bits out of the um, inefficiencies in the model. And then I think there's an option too, which could happen, which is kind of like Netflix and Spotify and the things that you guys use every day where there's all these artists, right? And somebody's pooling those artists and you're paying a subscription for those artists. And those artists are getting royalties depending on the downloads or the, you know, how many songs you listen to. Well, the, that, the, this option B is, that is what healthcare becomes. Somebody becomes that Spotify or that Netflix, they take those pissed off physicians and they pull them together. They, they figure out the risk management and how much to charge, right? And they disrupt the whole thing. Um, and blockchain makes that much easier. To Lisa's point, you don't need blockchain for a lot of this, but it makes it a lot easier. When you have smart contracts that can instantly compute 
you know, you had these patients, you know, you rendered these services, or maybe it's attributed based on just, you know, quantity and other things, um, and can pay them in, in a near real time, and they can, you know, have that money pushed right to their business debit card. I mean, you're talking about a transformed model. So um, it's very possible, and I think that's why this blockchain is getting so much attention, that somebody comes up with that, right? And we have some entrepreneurs here. You know, I see you guys raising your hands, and hopefully you're working on that kind of problem because that's how you can mess up this whole thing. So I'll just I, I will put a pitch out there for Pocket Doc. One of the reasons why we built out all the connections to the insurance companies and EMRs uh, was first we had to connect uh, all at least the healthcare stakeholders, so that then we could start to. Uh, transition them to a distributed network. So every user of our APIs will have access to DocChain, the blockchain network, whether or not they choose to become a node on the network. So a legacy system can participate and start to realize some of these gains, you know, quicker clearing times, uh, easier access to a shared uh, service for identity verification and resolution. Uh, referrals, you'll have access to that even if you aren't at a point of convincing your company, your health system to be a node uh, on a blockchain network. You still have that ability. So that was our, our vision. It's like we'll connect to them in the way they are today, the way they perceive it. We'll, tran we'll transform that into an API endpoint that any software developer can use to build new product. And then we'll seamlessly make that accessible to this distributed network over time. Yep. And uh, so, so we've talked a little bit about you know the types of scenarios where blockchain can be a good fit for the business and the natural uh, multi-user, the coordination problem, the uh, distributed network through which the data flows. Um, one thing I'm curious to hear about, uh, perhaps Max uh, or Lisa, you might might, might have. Uh, deeper insight into that. So there's a lot of options. If somebody thi is thinking right now, okay, I've got this problem, it seems to fit. Um, there are quite a few blockchains out there. How do I think about public blockchain, private blockchain, consortium blockchain? How do I think about the importance of a generic blockchain or perhaps a vertical or industry-focused solution? What are some of the pros and cons there? Whichever of you wants to start. Max <laughs> doesn't want to start. <laughs> well, I'll ask you. So um, it's healthcare data. So we, at least our position at PocketDoc, is we did not feel that you could go with a public blockchain for healthcare data. So DocChain is a permission chain. We don't uh, expect that it's going to be the only healthcare chain out there. Uh, you could even imagine a day where every individual had their own chain, you know, and, the, and they're all communicating with each other. So this is early days, uh, but and we don't also advocate storing patient data on the chain uh, for all sorts of reasons, not least of which is efficiency. But we do advocate storing pointers to the data uh, with access uh, ask and uh, access permissions, access grants being automated uh, on the chain. What, what Max said before, which I think is really important, is that it provides a, a, m a superior platform for doing the types of business rule automation and executing those business rules than what we have today. Uh, but we're in permission chain. Uh, we uh, do not store the patient data on the chain. You're going to hear a lot of people saying they're doing that. We don't advocate for that. Uh, and we can, I it we can get into the weeds on saying why. but. Happy to talk about more about it, and um, expect and are building in support for communicating with other chains uh, as is necessary to get business done and serve serve the individuals, the patients. Yeah, I would agree with Lisa that it'll start private because it's it it feels safer even even though it might not be um, because a lot of the benefits of blockchain come when it's it's kind of massively out there, but. Um, I think the only way health plans and payers started is in these kind of more like accountable care relationships, kind of closer knit things where you feel like it's a controlled B2B type of relationship. And then they gradually expand confidence and comfort. And plus, things have to stabilize on the technical front, right? 
you have to feel confident that this truly is more secure. I mean, theoretically it is. We all know that, right? But when you, when you hear a story in the news, or some, you lose consumer confidence. So I think it'll start that way, even though it's not really the best use of necessarily some of the blockchain technology. It'll start that way. And it'll start that way, um, I think, you know, right off the bat with the ACOs. I don't know if you agree, Chris, based on your experience. Yeah, I, th I think, I don't know if it's just going to be ACOs. I mean, clearly, anybody who's going for fee-for-value, it makes a lot more sense on multiple levels. And and I do agree, it has to be a private network right now because I if it's not, the vast majority of healthcare providers won't touch it just because of the fears around HIPAA and, and privacy. And, and, and making it in a way that really maximizes efficiency on the network where it's not about hoarding data in one little pocket, but having the pointer system is really important because you don't need all that data, which, I mean, you certainly don't need, if you were in a hospital state 10 years ago and your second day of the ICU, you don't need the telemetry from the second day of the ICU, although it might, it, it probably does exist, but you do need to know that somebody had an allergy to penicillin. You know, that's relevant. It becomes contextually relevant. So that kind of stuff is going to be very, very helpful, I think. So I th uh, Depending on what, what you may have heard, uh, we also are, uh, there are consensus uh, protocols you may have heard about, like with Bitcoin, you have miners, and it's proof of work. Um, in DocChain and others, we use different consensus models. We don't use proof of work. Uh, at, the, at present, we're working with Intel and uh, the first healthcare transaction set on, this is kind of an interesting thing to talk about, on Sawtooth, which is their blockchain architecture on the chip. Uh, so for there, we're using proof of elapsed time. Uh, and there's no mining involved. So that also allows us to have an enterprise grade permissioned uh, blockchain as opposed to a public blockchain where you have a, a lot of anonymous miners from all over the world verifying these blocks on a blockchain. That's very public activity. For an enterprise private chain, that's not really what you want, and you really don't want to have to depend on miners and that whole economic process. So we're using something called proof of lapse time. There's also proof of stake you might have heard you might have heard of. Uh, so one thing to think about, and why it was important to talk about Intel and the chips, is as we start u working with these vast amounts of data and thinking about optimizing transactions at that scale, you're starting to talk about the hardware. And uh, you're also, when you think about distributed networks, well, what's a distributed network? And think about IoT and all of the clinical devices. And think about international and diagnostic devices over uh, in the field. You're starting to think about a very different uh, ecosystem, very different uh, economy than we have today in healthcare. Um, so uh, let your let your imagination run a little wild. There's a lot of details associated with that that would take us far more time than we have. Um, we can do that over drinks. Yeah, over drinks. <laughs> but um, but it's uh, I don't agree that uh, permissioned blockchains are not a good use of blockchain technology. I don't agree with that. I actually don't think the ACOs will be the first to adopt <laughs> it. Uh, I wish they were, but I don't agree that they will be. I think it's a great use case. Uh, so there's there's some disagreement. But so <laughs> so on the note of agreeing to disagree, uh, and I'm getting a time signal here, um, uh, I think what would be really helpful if we can do just a quick rapid fire close uh, round here, if you just put your native hat on uh, in, in w the work that you do today, and imagine that somebody is uh, sitting here in your shoes, thinking about what's that first thing that needs to happen if you want to experiment with blockchain? What, what's the one or two maximum things you would recommend people think about, or what's the first thing they should do? So it depends on who your clients are going to be or who your end consumer, who are you going to sell to? So if you're building something, um, I would highly um, impress upon people the need to get some stakeholders um, wrapped around you that are completely, that are not in your company, that are relevant in whatever, you know, if they're in the healthcare field, that um, are really with you and are not, you're not just trying to do it alone. Because there's, there's going to be other companies that do all kinds of things in healthcare. 
and there will be a lot of blockchains, not just Pocketdoc, but um, you'll have a lot of consulting companies create a lot of confusion in the market. I'm quite certain of that. Um, everybody is looking at this as a way to, uh, um, my, my favorite thing right now is, is a number of consulting companies who have a strategy product that they'll come in and help you figure out what you can use blockchain for, and then they'll maybe eventually build one for you. Um, and there's a Dilbert um, cartoon that covers that pretty well. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, you have to have some sort of ecosystem behind you, and, and you have to really think about, be laser focused on what's your use case, what are you really trying to do? You know, um, I, I look at so many companies out there who, and I, and I try to give entree into anybody who's doing something innovative, and even two and three people company, but two or three people uh, uh, companies, but I think, I think the thing is, people don't have laser focus, and they're not always sure what their product is. And it's just like anything else. You've really got to be, what, what, is it, what is it you're trying to solve for? What's your thesis? And be prepared to get in it, show an MVP really works, and pivot as is necessary. And if you're not, um, if you don't have a product that you can get people really excited about very quickly, get out. Don't waste the time. Uh, I would recommend, unless you are uh, from a background where you like to build out platforms, uh, think of uh, think of the services layer. And as Chris said, like at Pocket Doc, we brought together insurers, not just health but also life, health systems, banks, technology companies, vendors, all to work with us on what were the key use cases they cared about that they would do together as one. So here's one, think about in a shift to value-based care, how do you prove that an episode of care has happened in order to accurately communicate it from a health system to a payer and involve all the appropriate, all, all the organizations and individuals who provided care Think about if you could, if every participant had a ledger, if it was all time stamped, so that you could verify when they'd completed that episode to each of their satisfaction. And making that available as an automated service to call, hey, start tracking me now. And Cambia, the Regents, of Washington could say, here's my protocol for tracking a knee replacement with post-operative uh, nursing facility care. Here's all the things that have to be satisfied before you can bill me for that. And you can call that as a service and I'll track it and it's all time stamped and when you're done, it will automatically bundle it up and send it to me, for example. So start thinking in terms of services complex, bless you, business <laughs> business transactions that have a lot of business rules associated and participants, and how could you automate that? Um, so I think those are great inputs. I would just add maybe, if I were looking at blockchain only, I would say it's all about timing um, and knowing your customer. So if I was starting a company today and tried to disrupt the system, I would I would definitely give blockchain a serious look. If I'm trying to sell solutions to corporations, I would tread cautiously. You have to think about who you have to convince. The chief security officer, the medical director, who are the who are the people that are gonna have to say yes and accept it and how risk averse is that culture and organization. Um, so think of your how's that gonna work? And then I think to build on Lisa's point, there's gonna be a lot of little things we can do once blockchain starts to take off, like the proof of whether someone actually had a service rendered or little, sur you know, you think about that letter of letters of credit example, all the, the people who have to verify those things along the way. So um, there may be little ways to add new business solutions to that, but that's further down the road. So right now, I mean, that's why we're heavily focused on learning about it, talking to partners, talking, looking at other industries that, we, that are ahead of us that we can learn from. And then really to Chris's point, is it the right, are we solving the right problem and does it accelerate that and can we get the ecosystem to cooperate? I'm going to disagree respectfully. We already have running code. Just don't tell them you're using blockchain. <laughs> 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 just solve it. Just solve it. It's a, it's a new database. 
yeah, it's awesome. Does this does this great thing? Would you like this thing? Would you like to? Would you like to get paid sooner? Awesome. Don't ever say you're using blockchain, <laughs> especially to a CFO. <laughs> Thank you. One other thing you definitely need is if you don't have a mad scientist in the background who's your CTO, <laughs> don't do it. Yeah, get, get a mad scientist is the <laughs> first recommendation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. So I know, Nicole, we have a few questions that came in from the uh, audience online, I believe. I think we've hit maybe a couple of those questions already. So if there's anything left, maybe if you want to get started with that, and then we'll open for a few more folks to, to ask questions from the audience. Okay. Hey, we did well. Um, so why don't we open to the audience? Please go ahead. And just before we jump in, if, if, if people asking questions, if you don't mind saying your name and where you're, wh what organization you're with. So, uh, okay, the question, I hate uh. when people do that. I can barely <laughs> keep it in my mind. Do you want me to so do the quantum so computing or no, do you I'm want gonna that go to one? Quantum <laughs> I actually know about that. I listened to Justin Trudeau's commentary on it. Um, I actually, uh, yeah, I've been following quantum computing for a long time before it was even um, officially out there. Didn't I say that? <laughs> before it was even openly discussed as a real thing. In fact, one very large company, who I shall not um, tell you their name, told me point blank that no such thing would ever come into existence. And I, w I don't know why I would even be asking about it. Now, that was only seven years ago. That was interesting. Um, it opens a ton of opportunity. I think it can work very effectively with blockchain um, in, in so many ways. I don't think they're going to override each other. Blockchain does one thing. Um, quantum computing does another thing. In terms of the other model that you talked about, um, how people might be able to transfer the, the value, and I'm paraphrasing, of what their insurance is or not. I don't know that we'll ever get to a single payer system. Um, Yeah. I, I only say this. I can easily see a time. I don't know if that scenario would ever come about. What I can see is a time where there will be derivative implications to it, where people will have um, elements. You'll be, you'll be able to manage entire populations of diabetics or people who fit certain um, criteria. And you'll be able to get people to do it much better and aggregate them in a different way, which lends itself to a derivatives market. I can see that happening. How that's used, I can, I can talk a long time about that could be a terrible thing or a great thing. I, I think that's a really interesting angle, right, that trading. Um, one thing that can happen if in today's world, when because this does happen, if you go out of network, you receive a check, then you're responsible to pay the doctor. You know what does happen in some cases? People cash that check, and they never pay the doctor. So I like that idea of using the cryptocurrency as almost like you have to transfer that to the doctor, and then maybe there's some method where they can unlock that to a, a f different form of currency to avoid the scenario where the consumer just cashes the money and never pays. So. That would have to be worked out, but it's a very creative use of it. Yeah. Yep. And blockchain would be perfect for it. Great. Next question. Hi. Uh, my name is Saki Litov. I'm a healthcare administrator. Um, Lisa, you said earlier, uh, you mentioned that there are a number of 
fairly large organizations that have been trying to pull data and have been failing. Um, can you speak, can you, who are these, you know, who are the organizations and why are they failing? Uh, Microsoft Health, Google Health. Um, I fear that one of the other big tech companies uh, is seeing itself as a source, as a central source of consumer data. Um, they fail because there's a lack of consumers' trust uh, in technology companies uh, pooling all of their healthcare data. Uh, they fail because they expected the people, uh, because so much of that requires that the consumer actively think to update it into a central location is something that people actually do, and they don't. You know, do you? you know, like, no, I, nobody wants to do that. You, know, you want to have... <laughs> Um, you want to have sort of an ambient experience that follows you around and allows you to access the data when you need it. Did I get that tetanus shot, you know, two years ago or ten years ago? I can't remember. I would like my physician to just be able, to, with my permission, to access that information. I don't care if it resides in Walgreens with my physician, with my insurance company, or my, you know, my my hospital. I just want to be able to access it when I need it. I don't want Microsoft to be the centralized source of that information, nor do I want Google to be the centralized source of that information. Um, I want a network that can easily share it. And that's what we've, we've seen groups like who, with all the best of intentions, wanted to offer that as a service, and it just keeps failing, a lack of trust, and it's just not what people do. Time for two more questions. Hi, thank you for uh, <coughs> your time today. Um, yesterday, Andy Slavitt was here, and he talked about making technology available for those in need because that's where the biggest healthcare cost is. And Chris, you also mentioned that as, as well in your comments today. So I'm curious, do you see any unique challenges or opportunities for blockchain when you're talking about that population? Because that's going to be very different than the 50-year-old with three Fitbits, you know, that runs eight-minute miles. Yeah, so we are very f focused on a lot of disparity populations, um, and there are some things that I can only categorize. I just feel like they're societal crimes. I mean, you can look at the uh, um, uh, mortality rates in some cities of African-American babies versus uh, white babies, and when 16 per thousand die versus four, there's something wrong with the system. There's something wrong with how information flows in the system. There is no um, silver bullet for those kind of things, but I do think um, mobility has allowed for something to happen, and it's democratized the ability to, to get internet, to be able to get information, um, and educate people and do a lot of things, and mobility is a very cheap way to do that. Not everybody has a computer, but almost everybody's got a cell phone, and if they don't have an iPhone, they have an Android phone, and that is a very good tool. And being able to connect with people and allow them to own their data and own their circumstances and, and connect them in a better way to resources that they don't even know that they have is, is imperative to me personally. So um, I can see it being very, very useful in those contexts. Um, just because opening up consumer ownership of their information and being able to link them is, is gonna be critical. Did I answer your question? Um, out, well, uh, I'm, I may not be communicating it well. Um, by just having the, the linkages created that are currently not, specifically in healthcare where you're dealing with um, protected information, which you're not allowed to just transmit between entities, but if a consumer allows it to happen and opens it up in an easy way and you take the barriers that are out, you can service those populations a little easier. But, but you're not working around them. You're engaging them. Does that make sense? And it could be as simple as each individual on Medicaid can authorize and authenticate with a thumb on yeah. this thing. Yeah. Well, another model, like I talked about that Netflix or Spotify model, like let's say you had many of those models and the physicians were almost creating their own 
right? You could almost have like a Tom Shoes model where this physician, because now you've gone from 6% compensation on the healthcare dollar to 70%, there's more, m there's more money for the physician to then allocate towards charity care, right? So maybe they have a sliding scale to join their network or their, you know, group. And so there might be, you know, when you take the, the money out of the administration part of healthcare and you give it back to the physician to have greater control, I think it enables those kind of Tom shoes like miles. And as a consumer, you might opt to pay a little bit more to join that group because you know that somebody else is getting covered. Um, and so there's, I think there's a lot of ways, but you know, it's kind of designing that future that we need to do. Mm -hmm. Great, last question over here. Hi, my name is Dennis McNanny, and uh, I'm with Cure Detail. We build a uh, medication adherence IoT product. Um, but my question relates back to a uh, previous part of my career where we uh, did revenue cycle management for spine and neurosurgeons. Uh, and what I think uh, I hear being described is uh, substituting the fragility of trust, uh, you know, having a system that people could trust, for the fragility of fragmented data systems. So if I wanted to go back and look at my uh, MRIs or my x-rays and my orthopedic practice had gone out of business, um, whatever that bit blockchain pointed to before may no longer be valid, and is there a strategy built in to continually remap uh, these pointers because it would quickly become out of date and, and, and kind of functionally useless uh, to someone who wanted to transmit that data to someone else? So we do that today in tracking uh, insurance company EDI gateways. Um, their business rules change sometimes more than once a day. Sometimes they just go down with no warning for as long as a week. Uh, so we do that today. We're part of what we offer as a service behind our APIs is to abstract that and the users of our APIs never have to, uh, have to deal with all of that change on the other end. So you're right, it's not gonna be perfect at first. So we're not gonna go out of the box and saying every mom and pop you know, individual practice or freestanding clinic around the country is going to digitize and make available all of your data. No, you know, that's not realistic. But, you know, what, what's the, you know, what's the best time to plant a tree 40 years ago, second best time today? <laughs> and so uh, we're taking that approach is best time to start it now is now and uh, provide the incentives and the means for more and more of your data to be digitized, made available and to build in the automation to track as those sources change. Okay, I think that's it for questions. I uh, just wanted to thank our amazing panelists and our moderator